Welcome back. In this and the next two segments, we will review in greater details the so-called three-part test. The test which determines whether restriction to freedom of expression are legitimate under international human rights law. In this segment, I will focus on the first test or step, the test of legality. I will explain what it means by presenting the conclusions of various expert bodies, as well as some decisions by the international jurisprudence. As was discussed throughout the last week, freedom of expression is a fundamental right, but it is not absolute. What it means is that international and regional provisions related to freedom of expression does recognize that that right may be restricted under certain conditions narrowly defined. For instance, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights state the exercise of the rights provided for in paragraph 2 the one that we've explored in the previous segment, carries with it special duties and responsibilities. Now, listen, I'm quoting from that article. It may therefore be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be such as are provided by law and are necessary for respect of the rights or reputation of others and be for the protection of national security or of public order, ordre public, or of public health or morals. As the non-governmental organization MLDI has well stated, the process of limiting freedom of expression or any, in fact, other human rights is not a blank check for government or dictators. It is not sufficient for a government simply to invoke national security or one of the other possible limitations and then violate human rights. There is a well-established process for determining whether the restriction is legitimate and whether the right, in this case, to freedom of expression may be limited. The process takes the form of a three-part test. And in fact, if you go back to the article, you will see that the article itself lays out the, the three-part test. Step one, the restriction must be provided by law. The principle of legality is at the heart of the rule of law. It involves the following. First, the restriction must have a basis in written law. This may include laws of parliamentary privilege and laws of contempt of court. However, it does not include traditional religious or customary law. And here I'm citing the Human Rights Committee, which says, given the serious implication of limiting freedom of expression, it is not compatible with the international covenant for a restriction to be enshrined in traditional, religious, or any other such customary law. The European Court for Human Rights had said that to be prescribed by law, a restriction must be adequately accessible and formulated with sufficient precision to enable the citizen to regulate his or her conduct. In Zimbabwe, the Constitutional Court in Shimakure versus Attorney General of Zimbabwe held that for a limitation to satisfy the principle of legality, it must specifically, clearly, and concretely in the law spell out the actual limitation to the exercise of freedom of expression. This is to enable a person of ordinary intelligence to know in advance what he or she must not do and the consequences of disobedience. Second, the law cannot confer upon government unfettered discretion. A situation where officials can make rule on a whim violates the principle of legality. Quoting here the Human Rights Committee in its general comment on legality. In adopting laws providing for restrictions, states should always be guided by the principle that the restriction must not impair the essence of the right. The relation between right and restriction, between norm and exception, must not be reversed. 
the laws authorizing the application of restrictions should use precise criteria and may not confer unfettered discretion on those charged with their execution, meaning the justice sector, but also the police and ultimately the government. Thirdly, the principle of legality means that the law must be compatible with international human rights provision, including those laid out in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also other international treaties. This is a very wise and crucial decision emerging from international jurisprudence, but also from the lessons of history. Let's indeed remember that some of the worst atrocities inflicted upon humankind were all laid in laws. Slavery, the Gulag, apartheid, many dimensions indeed of the Holocaust. All of these were somehow made legal. So not all laws are equal. There are good laws and there are bad laws. There are laws that enshrine human rights protection and there are laws that justify and legitimate their violation, indeed their massive violation. This later group of laws violate the principle of legality. So for instance, a law that provides for discrimination or for penalties that are incompatible with the international covenants such as corporal punishment, such laws do not meet the legality test. You may recall that last week, when we were looking at the African Convention on Peoples and Human Rights, I raised the issue of the so-called clawback clause of Article uh, 9. Uh, the article stated that everyone has the right to freedom of expression within the law. The African Commission ruled that this provision constituted a reference to international law, not domestic law, meaning that the only restrictions that can be enacted by the relevant national authorities are those which are consistent with state parties' international obligations under international human rights law. Finally, and we've already hinted to that last dimension of the principle of legality, the law must allow for people to determine their conduct, to regulate their conduct accordingly. And of course, it must be made accessible to the public. A secret law is of very little use in terms of regulating people's behavior. Uh, let me add that there are some countries where laws are indeed not made public. Here I'm quoting again from uh, the uh, Human Rights Committee. Vague laws will be abused. They often give officials discretionary power that leave too much room for arbitrary decision making. Vague laws have a chilling effect and inhibit discussions on matters of public concern. They create a situation of uncertainty about what is permitted, resulting in people steering far clear of any controversial topic for fear that it may be illegal even when it is not. In Zimbabwe, the Constitutional Court, in the case of Shimakure versus Attorney General, held that for a limitation to satisfy the principle of legality, it must specify clearly and concretely in the law the actual limitation to the exercise of freedom of expression. This is, and I quote them, to enable a person of ordinary intelligence to know in advance what he or she must not do and the consequences of disobedience. Let's illustrate the test of legality in a recent case discussed by the European Court for Human Rights. Let's consider the, the case of Sengus versus Turkey. The three applicants, Sengus, Agdenis, and Alti Parmarx, were lawyers or professors of law in Turkey when in May 2008, the Turkish government blocked all access to YouTube. The ban was justified under a law that prohibited insulting the memory of Atatürk. YouTube contained about 10 videos that were deemed an insult to Atatürk by the domestic court that issued the blocking order. The ban remained in effect from the 5th of May 2008 to the 30th of October 2010, when finally the order was lifted by the public prosecutor's office. 
Throughout 2010, the applicants sought to get the ban lifted through the domestic court system, citing the freedom to receive and import information, as well as the public interest in accessing an information sharing website such as YouTube. After the Turkish courts rejected the professor's argument, citing various reasons for that, the professors complained to the European Court of Human Rights. It will take five years for the court to review the case, but on December 1st, 2015, the court found a violation of the professor's right to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the European Court. And it actually highlighted the failure of the, the restrictions to meet the legality test. The court found that the ban presented an interference with the applicant's right to freedom of expression and that this interference was illegitimate because the law under which it was authorized allowed only for the banning of a specific publications in case an offense was suspected. A blanket ban of an entire website, such as in the present case, was not prescribed by law and therefore not lawful. The law did not authorize a blanket ban. It only authorized specific blocking of specific publication. For this reason, the court ruled in favor of the professors and against the uh, government of Turkey. So in conclusion, this segment has highlighted the meaning of the legality test. We've shown that the legality test requires to consider whether the law has a written basis, two, whether it complies with international standard, and three, whether it is sufficiently precise to allow people to adapt their behaviors to the law. We shall turn our attention in the next segment to the second part of the test, the valid ground test.